Welcome to the Therapy for Black Girls podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 124 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Did you know that there's a form of therapy called play therapy where things like toys and games are incorporated into the work? And it's not just for kids. Today, we have a guest therapist with us who'll share all about how she uses play therapy with her clients. Air hockey can get very aggressive. (laughs) Before we dive into that conversation, here's a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode. Introducing the all-new and totally reimagined 2020 Ford Explorer. It's built for modern exploration. Whether venturing across country or simply across town, over various terrains or through rough weather, it's all good. The Ford Explorer is specifically designed for comfort, confidence, and a whole lot of style. Ready to explore more? The 2020 Ford Explorer, the greatest exploration vehicle of all time. Built Ford Proud. Today, we're joined by Althea Simpson. Althea is the founder of Brighter Day Therapeutic Solutions and Unicorn Life Training. She is a licensed clinical social worker and a registered play therapist supervisor. Althea's experience in the fields of business and mental health spans more than 20 years. Althea and I chatted about how play therapy works, why it's not just playing with toys in session, how it can be used with people of all ages, and the qualifications one should have to conduct play therapy. If you hear something that resonates with you while listening, please share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Althea. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Joy. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you all about play therapy. So I know that this may be something that lots of people in our audience don't know very much about. I honestly don't know that much about play therapy myself. So can you kind of give us an introduction to what play therapy is? Well, play therapy is a creative-based treatment modality in the psychotherapy realm. It it pretty much goes off of the psychodynamic theories, but you can incorporate different theories into using play therapy, but it's just creative-based strategies to help clients, individuals, families, couples, adults to solve their own problems. So you use creative based techniques. So oftentimes it's difficult for people to talk about what's going on with them, their emotions, feelings and stuff. So play therapy kind of accesses that creative part of the brain. So the right part of the brain to help it talk to the cognitive part of the brain. And so you just use, it's outlined in the expressive therapies. So you have play therapy, art therapy, music therapy, drama therapy, all of those are expressive therapies to help, you know, clinicians to help their clients solve their own problems. So you mentioned something that I find very interesting. You did not stop at saying that it was just for children, right? So I think most times people would probably think, oh, if somebody's going to do play therapy, it would likely be for kids. But you mentioned adults, individuals. So it is not something that's just for children. No, play therapy is not just for children. Initially, when play therapy was created, and then you still have some play therapists who believe that play therapy is just for children 12 and under. But research is growing to show that play therapy is effective with all ages throughout the lifespan. My youngest client is three years old. And typically I go into the senior years or the more mature, as they would like to be called, (laughs) the mature years. So I work with clients of all ages throughout the lifespan using play therapy. Got it. Okay. So you've already mentioned people working through trauma might benefit from working with play therapy. 
Can you talk a little bit about some other kinds of concerns where play therapy might be helpful? Yes, play therapy is helpful for, um, you know, it, it's helpful for depression. I use it for depression. I use it for anxiety, just general stress. And like I said, you just incorporate different creative based techniques. I use sand tray. I use art. I use Legos and I give the clients prompts. Something like, what can you create a scene in the sand of the emotion that you've experienced the most this week? And I leave it up to them if it's happy or, you know, a positive or negative emotion. And then also even the same thing if I do Legos, create a model using the Legos that represents your biggest worry. You just incorporate different creative based things in to get individual, family, whatever client classification they are. You use different creative based techniques to get them to talking and accessing what is causing them stress. I use it with ADHD. Play therapy is also, there is even art play, A U T P L A Y, for children on the spectrum. So, play therapy is, is good for whatever your clients are coming in to talk to you about or to get help for as long as they're open to it. So can you talk to me about like an example, maybe with, you know, like a 20 something year old who might be depressed, how might you use play therapy with them to help them address the depression? I would ask them if they're open to it because I always get their permission to bring in creative based techniques. A lot of people are not familiar with play therapy. And again, they think that it's just for children. So I would first secure their permission to use play therapy with them. But I would typically do an art-based activity. And one of my favorites is called the DBT house. You give them different prompts to create a house. You start with the foundation of the house and you're asking them to write down the values that govern their life or the morals that they live by. As you go up and through the activity, you ask them to write down emotions that they want to feel less of or in a more positive way, behaviors that they want to change. And it's all while creating a house and they can use different colors. I have markers, crayons, colored pencils, whatever they want to use to, uh, I think, color Uh, magnifies what the issues are. That's why I give them the option to use different colors. And then even with the the billboard uh, in the activity, you ask them to, you don't want to just look at all of the negative things. So you ask them to uh, write things that they are proud of and want others to see. Uh, Who supports you? So it's just a directive play therapy activity that's art-based using a house and doors and trees and billboards. So I would imagine, and you know, I love that you said that you would ask permission for this because of course, you know, we want to make sure that we have buy-in, right? Um, yes. We're asking clients to do anything, but I would imagine that this could really be helpful for somebody who is maybe very anxious about therapy, right? And so not quite sure how to answer the questions or just feeling a lot of maybe performance anxiety about like interacting with a therapist. And so then they're directing maybe some of that anxiety on that activity that gives you another way into the conversation. Absolutely. And with play therapy, you have directive and non-directive play therapy. So what I just described is directive play therapy. You're giving the client prompts or asking the questions for them to respond to. And non-directive play therapy is when you ask them, you know, what you just put it out there. Like if I was using sand tray, I could do directive or non-directive sand tray. I could just give them all of the miniatures, sand tray miniatures and a sand tray and just see what happens. And they just start putting things in. And it's also good for introspective work when you use sand tray and Legos. You start building things and then you process that with the client. And if it's anything that you want to know know more about, then you just ask them, could you tell me a little bit more about Let's say if they had a spider in the sand tray, could you tell me a little bit more about the spider? So you can do non-directive and directive based play therapy. And it, I mean, it's just great to get 
get clients to reduce anxiety. Most of the time when I'm asking them questions and stuff afterwards and I mention something, they're like, how did you know about that? Well, you said it when you were processing whatever the activity that we did in the session. Got it. I love that. So you mentioned a couple of times out the uh, sand tray therapy. Can you talk more about what that is? So sand tray therapy, like I said, is an expressive therapy that can be incorporated into play therapy practice. And you use a sand tray and sand. There's a list of miniatures. When you select these sand tray miniatures, you should be selecting them with a purpose. It's not just random toys and stuff that you just see and you pick up. There's a list. You should have people with disabilities, non-disabilities. You should have different like medical stuff. And it's just a whole list of miniatures that you should have in your sand tray collection to help clients address what they're coming in to address. But the biggest thing about sand tray is that we as the therapist or clinician, we do not name what is in the tray. So if someone put a chair in the sand tray and say it's apple pie, it's apple pie. We do not name it. We also don't guess what the sand tray is or what the, even if you're doing art-based therapy using creative arts, you don't name what the client did. You allow the client to tell you what it is because it could be something different. Just like I said, if it's a chair and someone is using a chair, but they're saying it's apple pie, it's apple pie. Got it. Okay. So really a lot of this is like looking at what kind of story the client is making and them um, kind of telling you what's important and what's relevant in their lives based on maybe the things they're choosing to play with, maybe the things they're choosing not to play with. Like you are kind of opening conversation based on the observations you are making while they're playing. Yes. And you just mentioned a big part of play therapy is observing. As the play therapist, you are observing the client. You are observing what they're doing as they work through solving their own problems and addressing the experiences or feelings that's difficult for them to express. We observe and then we interpret what they're doing. And a, and a person who's untrained in play therapy would not know that. Mm-hmm. So talk to me a little bit about the training. Like what does training look like for somebody who wants to incorporate more play therapy maybe into their practice? Okay, I'm glad you asked because I love play therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so to become a registered play therapist, there are three credentials that you can get. Uh, you could be a registered play therapist, a registered play therapist supervisor, which I am a registered play therapist supervisor and uh, a school-based registered play therapist. The school-based registered play therapist is new in the recent years, and you only can get the school-based registered play therapist credentials if you work in a school. But the process is still the same. You need 150 training hours. Of those 150 training hours, only 50 of them can be what we call non-contact hours. And that's taking a training online where you review a PowerPoint and then you answer the questions and submit the questions and then get your certificate. Or you read an article which can be accessed online through the Association for Play Therapy or any play therapy approved provider. And so you read the article, you answer the questions. Those are considered non-contact hours and you can get up to 50 of those. The other 100 must be in person. So that an in-person means that you are able to interact with the trainer. So you need 150 training hours. You need 35 clinical supervision hours under a registered play therapist supervisor. If you're getting your hours under a registered play therapist, you need 50 clinical supervision hours. That is changing in January 2020 because now there are enough registered play therapist supervisors where they are changing the criteria where you have to get your clinical supervision from a registered play therapist supervisor. That's 2020. And so then you have to work 2,000 hours 
it's just like getting a clinical license. Yeah. <laughs> and so that deters a lot of people from getting the credentials because they're like, uh, that's just like getting another license. And it's like, okay, that in my opinion, that's a good thing because you want to be competent. And it, I think it's great that you're required to, you know, hone in on your skills to use these different treatment modalities. Yeah, yeah, completely. And I think, you know, and I'm, like I said, not super familiar with play therapy as much either, but it seems like when you are doing these things that require maybe more projection, right? So you are using more interpretation, then it is important for you to kind of see a variety of different cases to be able to talk with your supervisor about these things so that you, when you're making these interpretations, you can be fairly certain that you're making accurate interpretations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because a lot of it is you are really observing what the client is doing and then interpreting what they're doing and without naming what they're doing. And they guide the sessions. And when I work with clients, whether it's play therapy or non-play therapy, I always start the session with what are we focusing on today? So I always leave it up to to it being a client centered, the client guiding their session. And if they say, I don't know, then I'm like, okay, well, what about working on this that you mentioned in a previous session? And I have training directives for sand tray, directives for using, like I said, Legos, art. I even do messages in music, which is another expressive therapy that you can incorporate in play therapy practice where I I pick songs and the client picks songs and we listen to the song and then I ask them questions about what they hear. How does it relate to your life? Is any part of this related to your life or, you know, what do you think the message is in this song? How do you think the person and singing the song was feeling how did it make you feel those type of things so it is very introspective and you are interpreting a lot of what the client is thinking and feeling yeah so I feel like that could go one of two ways right and especially I'm thinking about you know working with like black kids right so I think that there is something that you have to understand about black children to be able to make accurate interpretations maybe around play or you know the kinds of things things that they're doing. And so I wonder if that's a part of the conversation, right, for non-Black therapists being able to make accurate interpretations when they are not necessarily familiar with the culture. Absolutely. And that's the whole reason why I created the Black Play Therapy Symposium, to be able to have more culturally responsive treatment for the Black community and other communities of color, uh, because the needs are different. The mindset is different. And what I see often is when I go to trainings and workshops, I am either the only person of color in the training or one of three to 50 people, 50 to 100 therapists that's in the training. And so I was looking at that and I've been doing this since 2010. I always used creative based therapies from the moment I started as a social worker out of grad school getting my hours, but I was uh, formally introduced to play therapy in 2010. And I was like, oh, this is something that's for real, for real. (laughs) I've always used it, but this is something that's for real. And so from 2010 until uh, even now, there are not a lot of Black clinicians that I see that show up at these trainings to be formally trained in play therapy, but a lot of people are using play therapy and saying that they're a play therapist. Without those credentials, you are not a play therapist. And there's a difference between playing in therapy and using play therapy. Mm-hmm. And that difference is, is like you can just uh, you can use games. I use trouble. I use sorry. All of those types of games that are games that we grew up on. Well, at least I know I grew up on playing in childhood and stuff. And uh, I incorporate that in therapy. But you have to know why you're using that game and not just using that game to pass time to say you're seeing clients. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, because when you mentioned the thing about like using music in, in therapy, like I've heard other therapists talk about that too. Um, but I think, again, like you mentioned, it really is important to be intentional about why you're using these things. Absolutely. You have to be intentional about why using these games, even with a game called dominoes. I use dominoes, one, for decision making. You have to make a decision on where to put that domino and then I process with them and incorporate things from their lives where they have to make decisions about things or if they get frustrated when you use in trouble and sorry. And there, there are just so many ways to use those things. But if you don't get the formal training, you really don't know why you're using these games or these creative based treatment modalities. Mm-hmm. And It just sounds glamorous to say I'm a play therapist, but there's a lot of work that comes into being a play therapist. Absolutely. And I would imagine you likely have some difficult conversations with parents also about like, well, what are y'all doing in there for an hour? Like y'all are playing Monopoly? Like, is that what I'm bringing my child here for? So what kinds of concerns do you sometimes hear from parents and how do you explain to them like what kind of work is being done in the treatment? Okay, so when I first started doing play therapy, I used to be like, oh my God, I am just uh, in here playing with these kids, getting paid to play with kids, right? And uh, that was before 2010 when I really realized that this is a treatment modality. Although they were uh, making progress and we were working on things, I think that my mind is just creative and I look at why I'm working with a client and what their needs are, especially when you're working with children and adolescents to make it not be so boring. Right. But then have the parents when they go out and I used to say to my clients, you you, you trying to get me in trouble telling your parents you just play the game. But I would have that conversation with the parents and say that, you know, I would explain what play therapy is. But I do that up front when I get that first call. And I talk to the parents or even the client, if they're an adult, I let them know that I am a registered play therapist and I use a lot of creative based strategies in sessions if you're open to it. But specifically for parents, I have that conversation when I have that phone call. So I explain to them what play therapy is, why I use it, and I even incorporate the parents into play therapy sessions because I do not work with anyone under the age of 18 without parental involvement. And they know that up front from that first phone call with me. So I just explained it. So I don't really have too many issues with them coming out saying, oh, I just played a game. And so, but if a child says that when we are wrapping up, because I give the parents an opportunity to do a wrap up with me and, um, and they say, oh, I just played a game. And then I ask them, well, what is the focus? Can you tell your parent the focus of that game? What were we focusing on while we were playing the game? And then APT, the Association for Play Therapy, has pamphlets that details out what play therapy is and how effective it is and why to use it and the benefits. And I also give that to parents. Got it. Okay. So you also mentioned that I want to go back to this, that play therapy might be an effective intervention for couples. Have you done any couples work with play therapy? And can you tell us not, of course, specifically about any particular couple, but how might you use this with a couple? So play therapy with couples, I, again, I will use, uh, I will use Santre and give them a prompt to uh, create a scene of when you first met create a scene of a problem that you have in there using miniatures and stuff. And then we talk about whatever it is that they created in the sand. So use the Legos to create a model of a nightmare problem that you all have as a couple. And I've even done date nights in my office for couples where they had game night and there are different cards that you can use. The ones that I use uh, most is called the ungame. I don't like using the board game. I use the cards and now they have different cards that come with it. And they have cards specific for adults, for families and for couples. And so if I was using play therapy and doing a date night in my office with a couple, let's say I use trouble. 
Trouble is a game that everyone has and they could just pick that up at the store. And so I would tell them, pick a number. And every time that number is plucked, you have to answer a card. It's very specific that the partner cannot interrupt what their other partner is saying even if they don't agree, they have to wait until they finish before they can respond. So there are many ways to incorporate play therapy with couples. Yeah, I love that, especially because then you're kind of teaching. Um, it sounds like a part of what that activity would be is listening for the purpose of listening and not listening to respond, which, of course, we know is what happens with a lot of couples, right? Like you're listening so that you can say what you want to say to your partner as opposed to what the partner actually said. Um, so it seems like you could do a lot of really cool stuff with games and play therapy with couples. And then even when we are not using the games, but we're using the cards, I have the chalk boards like when the best time to get a whole bunch of creative stuff to incorporate in play therapy is during the sales time after us um, after a holiday season so for valentine's day one year i was able to get these chalkboards that's like that's in hearts like these black and red glittery chalkboards and stuff and so and it has a string around it and so I got two of those for the couples and stuff in the chalk and you just um you know give them like you ask them questions and have them respond and stuff and I even have a wand uh where there are couples who get overly excited and like oh no 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 that's not how it happened they have to put up the wand and that signals that you're not supposed to be talking until I'm done mm-hmm. until I hand off until I hand off the wand to you. And uh, those are even shaped in like hearts and butterflies and those types of things. Yeah. So, I mean, so that could be the kind of thing that a couple could also replicate at home, right? Like they learn it from you and then they learn to incorporate that in their conversations at home. Absolutely. And I encourage them to do uh, date nights at um, date nights at home. And uh, for couples who really have uh, trouble communicating uh, with each other and it's difficult uh, for them to even uh, interact. Uh, and they, but they have a busy schedule too. What I tell them: have a jar at home and uh, have a piece of paper, and you write different types of notes. Uh, you know, affectionate notes, uh, things that you want to talk about uh, at the end of the week or the beginning of the week, and stuff. And you just drop those in a jar, and then you spend some time. You pick a day that that's your your time, and then you just go through those things in the uh, that's in the jar and some people are like well um, why would I want to be in a relationship where I have to use paper and uh, pull from a jar Um, well it's to get you to start conversing more with each other (laughs) Um, you know and stuff you're not you're saying that communication is a problem Uh, so it sounds like that there's some need uh, for you all to uh, be able to Uh, converse with each other and especially positively. So that's an activity that I have them do, um, do at home, especially for those who are, who are busy. Got it. Okay. So you mentioned earlier also, Althea, that um, you might even use play therapy for kids younger than five, especially if there's some trauma. Can you talk more specifically about like how play therapy is used with kids who've experienced trauma? Well, depending on the, um, depending on the age, um, I I don't use sand tray with kids under the age of five. I really don't like using sand tray with kids uh, that's uh, five years old unless they are um, a little more advanced because there is a processing and a communication. But for most kids, play therapy, they really um, they really learn how to uh, resolve inner conflict on their own with me just sitting there watching them play. Uh, they're playing out uh, what's going on in their world. And you see that uh, come to life in the sand or even in an aggr- I have an aggressive playroom uh, so uh, just even letting them play out that aggression that they need to get out but for children there are many things that you I'd use a lot of coloring pages um, 
that something very basic, something very simple. Uh, you can get coloring books from the dollar store or the dollar bin and stuff. And what I do is I have them color those. And then we talk about the emotions that's on the, or, uh, that's on the character's face. What is this? What do you think that this character, uh, is feeling or what emotion, um, are they showing and stuff? And we talk about that. And then can you tell me a time when you felt sad or angry or hurt, those types of things. So when they're under, uh, when they're under the age of five, you're very, um, there's not a lot that you can, uh, well, for me, because I'm very creative and I like, uh, I like doing a lot of activities and stuff, but for them, it's very basic, but it's effective coloring. Um, I do uh, bubble art. I do painting. Uh, they can use paint and paint the uh, splatter your emotions using a color and then ask them, well, um, can you tell me about that color and how did it make you feel and stuff? But for younger kids, it's really just allowing them to play out. And that's why it's so important for you to have the right tools and not just any uh, picking any types of toys to just have in your playroom. Mm-hmm. So tell me more about this aggressive playroom. What kinds of things are in the aggressive playroom? So in my aggressive playroom, I have a um, air hockey. Air hockey can get very aggressive. <laughs> oh. I have, a, I have an, an air hockey machine in my uh, aggressive playroom. Uh, they get very upset when those little red uh, discs go in and stuff. And then they start just playing so aggressively to try to get a point. I have different... Um, different characters, the superheroes and stuff. And I have all things, uh, army, uh, battlefields, uh, missile launchers. Uh, I have swords that I have different types of swords, some that light up and make noise, some that, that, that don't, they can, uh, I have costumes like the SWAT um, SWAT is, I have a SWAT costume. I have a, um, firemen's costume and uh, military costumes and stuff there. They can dress up and they just act out their aggression. And I sit there and I observe. And if it's any, if I see a theme that keeps coming up, then uh, in the next session, I will ask them, can we do um, some type of activity that we um, that's based off of what I heard or saw or that recurring theme, because sometimes you have recurring themes uh, when you're uh, using play therapy, especially in sand trade, or if they keep going to the same game or they keep wanting to do the same type of activity, you want to explore those themes. So then that's when I shift more into directive And I'll say, okay, can we start off with an activity uh, that I want to do? And then you can do uh, your play. So that's the switch into non-directive because when kids are used to doing the non-directive and you try to throw in a directive, they are like, oh, I don't want to do this. But I I ask them, can we do, so I do my non-directive that way I am getting more information about what I saw or what I wanted to know more about by doing directive and then for 15 minutes and then letting the next 30 minutes to 40, 45 minutes be non-directive. And I find that the kids are usually open to that because they know that after I do this, what Miss Althea wants, then I will get to do my non-directive play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course the kid maybe thinks about it as like a free play time, but you're still using all of that as information. Yes. And then we talk and one of the things about play therapy is that you don't go into the child's play unless they invite you in. Mm. Mm -hmm. They have to invite you in. And that's why it's so important for you to be able to observe and interpret what's going on because you cannot enter their play unless they invite you in. Okay. So like if you're playing air hockey, like they might invite you to take the other paddle or whatever. Yes. Got it. Okay. okay. Or if they're doing aggressive play or sand tray, um, and then you don't talk to them because it can interrupt the flow 
of what they're what they are trying to work through. So what does progress in play therapy look like, Althea? Like how can how can you tell that progress is being made throughout the course of play therapy? I can tell progress is being made throughout the course of play therapy. Um, let's say that a, ch- a child was, or even an adult was highly anxious. And then, so what I do is I, I check in, I do therapeutic check-ins with them every couple of weeks to see where they were three weeks ago. So if I do it in three weeks, where were you three weeks ago and how are those symptoms now? Uh, you can see a decrease in the symptoms if they were having nightmares. There's a decrease in nightmares, especially for kids who um, was exposed to trauma um, or even witnessed domestic violence and they working that stuff out. They're getting it out of their system and getting it out of their heads and stuff. And so they're able to sleep better. There, you start noticing less behavioral problems in school. Um, I had, um, I do, um, contingency plans with uh with kids and even some adults because they like cheesecake and stuff so (laughs) so like you meet these goals then we'll have uh have a celebration and stuff and so I would incorporate that into their um into their treatment as well and I always secure the permission of the parent to uh, bring in like the treats and stuff, whatever is their favorite treat. So if a kid is having a lot of behavioral problems in school, I'll say, well, let's start off with seeing if you can go two out of the five days without getting on blue because you want to make sure that they feel capable. So you don't want your goals and stuff for them to be overwhelming where they don't feel that they can reach them. And so, but when you start seeing a decrease in the symptoms and stuff, then uh, you know that the play, uh, play therapy or the therapeutic interventions that you're using is, um, is working for them. So once you start with someone using play therapy, is it kind of play therapy across the board or are you maybe switching back and forth between play therapy and other modalities? It depends. It depends on the client. I've had uh, clients, especially adults, who um, I started out with. Uh, talk therapy. And here's the thing about play therapy. You can incorporate uh, cognitive behavioral therapy into play therapy. Um, So, uh, but I would start off with talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And, uh, and then if they're not moving and they're, they're still, they're not moving and they're complaining about still being in the same place, then I would ask them to, um, if we can incorporate play therapy. And so uh, when we incorporate that play therapy and stuff and they start moving and um, moving in a different direction and they're not stuck. Uh, but for play therapy, you can, uh, and then I have some that I start play therapy with and then they're like, you know what? I don't want to do this. And we just sit there and we, um, and we talk. Uh, but, in a way we're still kind of doing play therapy because I still use my, um, my cards, uh, to promote conversation and, uh, around different things because they're still blocked. They still have difficulty talking about, uh, what's going on with them and these cards, they, uh, provoke conversation. Got it. Okay. And are there any concerns, Althea, um, that would not be appropriate for play therapy? Well, I, let me, I haven't run into any, uh, any situations where, or any diagnoses that would not be appropriate for play therapy, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you about, uh, in using, so I would imagine psychosis mm-hmm. would difficult, but I don't train in the areas of psychosis. Yeah. I don't take clients that that's diagnosed with psychosis. So play therapy has been, uh, I've been able to use play therapy with depression, anxiety, trauma, even, uh, even some bipolar, uh, some bipolar, uh, disorder, uh, clients that had bipolar disorder. I've used, uh, play therapy with. 
Okay. So as far as you know, um, at least in your experience, there have not been any contraindications. Yes. Yeah. And and I think it just depends on the uh it depends on the clinician too. And uh if you want so I am very creative and I like seeing what I can do with play therapy. And uh so if I try something and it's like, okay, this worked but this part didn't work. So I'll either try to revamp what didn't work or toss it out, but keep what worked. And so, and uh, being a clinician in private practice and owning my own private practice, I have the ability to be as creative as I uh, would like to be as long as I'm staying within ethical boundaries. But I even started a fire in my office, a fire pit to do uh, s'mores uh, oh, to, very cool. To, and the activity and that, that was just something that I read in a book and I was like, OK, I want this uh, person to have s'mores because it had a significant meaning to them. But they couldn't uh, and but they couldn't do use. I mean, they wasn't in a place where they can have them like um, in the way that they liked. Mm-hmm. So I did a fire pit in my office and created s'mores. And I was like, but how do I make this therapeutic? And I was like, okay, I can make the graham crackers, the body, the marshmallows, the mind, and the chocolate can be the feelings. You know, uh, you have sweet chocolate could be the positive feelings and dark chocolate could be the negative because that's a little bit bitter. And um, and just going there. So I think it all depends on the um, on the clinician that's using play therapy and uh, what they want to accomplish with it. But that still requires training to have that foundational knowledge about play therapy. Right, right. Got you. So what are some resources out there? Uh, Are there any kind of like non-clinician focused uh, resources that you would suggest for maybe parents who are interested in hearing more or if people are listening and thinking, oh, play therapy may be a good fit for me. Are there any resources that you would point people to? Yes, I would point them to a4pt.org and that's a, the number four P is in Paul, T is in training, uh, org. That's the Association for Play Therapy uh, website. And they have a whole section for, uh, for parents. Okay. And then they also have a section about um, education and training and what it, uh, what it takes. And they also have articles and everything. So the best resource uh, to learn more about play therapy, I would direct them directly to the uh, Association for Play Therapy website. They have a lot of information there. Perfect. And where can we find you online? Can you share your website as well as any social media handles you'd like to share? Uh, my website is uh, brighter uh, www.brighter-day.net, and I am on uh, Instagram. And my Instagram handle is Althea Simpson Biz B I Z, and Althea Simpson on Facebook. And I also have a um, Unicorn Life Play Therapy page where I post a lot of information and resources for parents and clinicians. Perfect. And you mentioned um, you also have the conference. Yes, the Black Play Therapy Symposium. We had I had the inaugural Black Play Therapy Symposium uh, April 12th through the 14th. Uh, 2019, and it was focused on healing the Black child and family. And so the second annual play therapy conference, Black Play Therapy Symposium, is April 17th through the 19th at the Hyatt Regency at Tyson's Corner in Fairfax, Virginia. And the theme is Healing Communities of Color. Perfect. And of course, we will include all of that in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Althea. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Joy. I'm so glad Althea was able to share her expertise with us today. To find out more information about her and her practice, check out the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 124. Don't forget to share this episode with two people in your circle and share your takeaways with us either on Twitter or in your IG stories using the hashtag TBG in session. 
A reminder for all of my Atlanta listeners, I'll be in conversation with Dr. Key Hallman, the incredible founder of the Village Market ATL, on this coming Sunday, September 22nd at 5.30 p.m. at the Gathering Spot. We'll be chatting about prioritizing our mental health as Black women business owners and how taking care of ourselves helps us to thrive in life and in business. So I'd love for you to come out and join us for this conversation. There are a few tickets left, and you can grab one at therapyforblackgirls.com slash Dr. Key. And of course, this information will be included in the show notes. Remember that if you're searching for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic and meet some other sisters in your area, Come on over and join us in the Yellow Couch Collective, where we take a deeper dive into the topics from the podcast and just about everything else. You can join us at therapyforblackgirls.com slash YCC. And don't forget to visit our online store where you can grab a copy of our guided affirmation track, breakup journal, or your favorite Therapy for Black Girls t-shirt, mug, or sweatshirt. Grab your goodies at therapyforblackgirls.com slash shop. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. <music>